Welcome to the Health Science Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, the Director of Health Education for the National Health Association, the NHA. And today I'm incredibly pleased to have as my guest, Dr. Cyrus Kambada. Uh, Cy has a uh, PhD in nutritional biochemistry. Uh, he is the co-founder of Mastering Diabetes, an incredible online support and information site to help people improve their metabolic status and health. He's also the author of Mastering Diabetes, the book itself, which is a bestseller that provides a revolutionary approach for really reversing insulin resistance in all forms of diabetes. So without further ado, welcome, Cy. It's such a great time. It's so great to see you. Welcome to the Health Science Podcast, brought to you by the National Health Association, the oldest organization in the world, championing the extraordinary benefits of a whole plant food diet and healthy lifestyle, as well as water-only fasting. We believe that health results from healthful living and focus on evidence-based science that promotes the health of you and your loved ones, as well as the health of all animals and the environment. We feature experts from a cross-section of disciplines within the plant nutrition, vegan, psychological, environmental, and animal compassion sectors. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, the NHA's Director of Health Education. Dr. Frank, I love I love talking with you, and uh, I appreciate the invitation to be here today. So thanks I'm going to start off with an interesting story for you. I'm going to lead into something. Uh, when I was it. teaching at Life Chiropractic College, I started a natural hygiene club, which teaches lifestyle approaches mm -hmm. like the NHA offers. And one of the students came up to me thinking that he had kind of uh, reinvented the wheel by discovering these principles. But he realized now that as I was teaching them, this was already in place for several hundred years. Yeah. So that guy was Doug Graham, who then, oh, went, on wow. to, <laughs> then went on to write his 80-10-10. And I know that had some influence on the way you have uh, approached your work with diabetes. So I just wanted to share that with you because it's interesting That's awesome. how that came full circle. And I'd like to start with the idea that I know, you know, there was a time in your life early on when you were, you know, you were athletic, you were pushing, you were living, you know, a full life. And then you kind of got a little stopped in your tracks with these diagnoses of autoimmune diseases, Hashimoto's and alopecia, and then of course, type one diabetes. And I know those things become just a small blip in the biography but I know that must have been traumatic. That must have been, you know, it must have been shocking and it must have been devastating in its own way. So can you talk about that revelation and then how that propelled you into the next steps in your, you know, your own discovery? Absolutely. You're right, because the year was 2002. So we're looking at literally 20, 21 years ago at this point. And I was just a senior in college trying to graduate and move on with my life. And I was studying engineering. So I didn't really know anything about human health. All I knew was that I felt terrible. Uh, and so within a very short period of time, I went from being a you know, normal, happy-go-lucky, you know, 22-year-old guy who was working out multiple times per week, you know, relatively you know, eating a healthy, a quote-unquote healthy diet, socializing as much as possible. And then all of a sudden, I got slammed with low energy, frequent urination, and cramping when I would go to sleep to the point where my legs would cramp, my abdomen would cramp, my chest would cramp. My, my, my arms would cramp and I was like, man, something is definitely wrong. So I picked up the phone. I called my sister and I said, Hey, what's going on? She's a doctor of osteopathy, family practice medicine. She's brilliant. And she said, Cyrus, this is type one diabetes. Like I know all the symptoms, no question, go straight to the hospital. So I ended up showing up at the hospital and they diagnosed me with type one diabetes. Like you mentioned, type one diabetes, alopecia, universalis, which is why I have no hair, no eyebrows, no eyelashes, nothing. And then Hashimoto's hypothyroidism. So if you can imagine the transition going from you being you today, non-disease, quote unquote, healthy to 24 hours later being diagnosed with three autoimmune conditions. Yeah, that's why I asked you. It had to be devastating. It had to be a devastating yeah. outcome. Yeah. No, it was, it was ridiculous. I mean, I remember being discharged from the hospital after about 24 hours and they said to me, listen, you have three autoimmune conditions. Uh, here's your prescription for basal insulin and bolus insulin. Here's a carbohydrate counting guide. Here's a prescription for test strips. Here's a blood glucose meter. Check your blood glucose six, seven, eight times a day. Inject insulin before every meal. Uh, good luck. You know, and I was like, what? what are you talking about? Are you kidding me? I'm not, I don't know how to just transition to being insulin independent. You can't just do that overnight, right? right. And so emotionally, I felt 
very uh, vulnerable. And um, I'm not afraid to admit that I was scared because I thought that I had done something to cause all of this. And like to this day, uh, I still don't know whether or not that is a true statement or not because nobody's been able to answer that. And, you know, autoimmunity has a whole bunch of causes that are known and not known. And so it's impossible for me to determine whether or not I was the one that created this problem or these collections of problems in the first place. But truth be told, I don't even care. At this point, it doesn't really matter. But at that point, I was nervous. I was, I didn't have any answers to questions. And the main question that I was trying to ask myself is, what do I do so that I can maximize my quality of life and not end up with horrendous complications of type 1 diabetes? Because the complications of type 1 diabetes are not pretty at all. Right. We're talking how, blindness. How old, were you at that? how old were you at that point? I was 22 years old. 22. Yeah. So, so there was actually one moment where about a week later, this was like at the very end, this is like November, December. So, so I was going through finals. So I get diagnosed with type one diabetes. I end up having to like, you know, try and figure out how to inject insulin in a short period of time and uh, doing a very poor job at it. Uh, I show up to a final seven days ish later and I'm sitting at the back of the classroom and there's a bunch of words that are written on the, on the chalkboard. And there's a, you know, 75, hundred students in the room and everyone's you know, taking their exam. And the professor gets up at the front of the classroom and writes something in very large letters on the board, you know, something about like 15 minutes left or so. And I'm, and I'm in the back of the classroom and I look at the board and I'm like, what does that say? Mm. I can't read it. And I was like, I was like, my eyes were kind of like, like trying to focus on it. And it was kind of blurry and then not blurry, then blurry, then not blurry. And I'm sitting here and I'm like, are you kidding me? My vision is starting to go too. Right. Like I just got diagnosed with three autoimmune conditions. Now my vision's not doing well. My digestive status is ridiculous. What's next? Mm -hmm. Right. And so it just felt like there was, I was just like on a downward slope of one condition after another, after another, after another. And uh, it, it was a very not fun time in life. Let's put it that way. And so it went from there to what was the next journey of discovery for you that is leading you closer and closer to where you are now. I mean, obviously you had to deal with the medical intervention, the drug intervention, trying to manage all of that as a 22 year old person, when all you want to really do at that age is kind of party and live your life and not worry about these kind of things. 100%. And here all of a sudden you're like tossed in this arena of total preoccupation with the medical system and, and drug mm -hmm. intervention. So tell me the next steps that kind of got you to the next place of kind of intellectual development that, that got you on this path. So the, the doctors had told me at that time, they said, listen, low carbohydrate diet, that's the only way to go. Because if you're living with any form of diabetes, especially type one diabetes, then limiting your carbohydrate intake is a smart idea. Because if you limit your carbohydrate intake, then you will limit your blood glucose excursions and you will limit your insulin use. It sounds very logical. It's very linear, right? Less carbohydrate means less blood glucose means less insulin. So I said, okay, sounds like a plan. So they said, eat more turkey burgers and quote unquote, healthy fats and lean meats, right? And peanut butter and, and uh, cheese and dairy products and white meat and red meat and fish and olive oil. And so I was like, okay, great. Sounds like a plan. And I would just eat more of those foods. Meanwhile, I was trying to avoid uh, breads and pastas and potatoes, root vegetables and fruits, because those are the foods that contain carbohydrates and carbohydrates are bad for you. And if you eat carbohydrates, then bad things are going to happen and your glucose is going to go all over the place. So I said, okay, fine, let, let's, let's try that. So I did that for the better part of, you know, about a year or so. And I got to tell you, Frank, I consider myself to be a relatively, relatively smart dude. And I could not make that system work. I was, I was only eating about hundred grams of carbohydrate per day, which is technically considered a, a low carbohydrate diet. Right. And my glucose was a freaking disaster. It was all over the place. At any moment in time, my glucose could be as low as a 40, which is hypoglycemic, as you know, right. all the way upwards of a 400, which is severely hyperglycemic. And it was just ping-ponging every day, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. It literally felt like I was playing a video game, and I had this random number generator in my palm, and I, every time I checked my blood glucose this device would give me a number and the number was just like literally just it was it was a made up number so i would check my glucose and right now it would be looking to be like a 95 and be like okay great that's a good number sounds like a plan eat some food inject a little bit of insulin an hour later i check my glucose 
340. It's like, awesome. Inject more insulin. Check my glucose. 292. Awesome. Check my glucose. 71. I was like, awesome. Now I got to eat some food. And it was like, there was just no systematic procedure for trying to achieve a relatively stable blood glucose. Uh, in addition to that, I couldn't exercise as much as I wanted to. And, you know, I grew up as an athlete playing soccer, baseball, you know, lifting weights, you name it. And I just couldn't do that stuff because my body hurt. Literally, my muscles were so tight and my joints were hurting that I was like, oh, now I feel like I'm an 85 year old man and I can't use this body the way that I want to. So I did that for a year. I was living in San Francisco. I had started venturing, opening my mind to the idea that maybe there was a different way. And I... Uh, made friends with people in different pockets of life. And I ended up making friends with uh, these, these uh, friends of mine that we would consider to be like hippies, you know, by all, you know, that's, that's what they were referred to. And people would talk about them that way. And I was like, whatever, these people are very cool. I'm going to hang out with them. And one of them said, Hey, Cyrus, you should talk to Doug Graham. I was like, who's Doug Graham? And he said, uh, you know, he's a guy who teaches people living with all forms of diabetes or, and beyond how to adopt a raw food diet. And by doing so, they can transition towards, you know, a significantly improved state of health. And I was like, great, sign me up. Sounds like a plan. So I got in contact with him, picked up the phone. I called him and I said, hey, Doug, here's my situation. Do you think you can help me out? And Doug, I love Doug. <laughs> I love Doug. He's great. He, with such confidence, he said, Cyrus, you have no idea, absolutely no idea what's about to happen to you. Come over here to this retreat that I'm holding. It's in Colorado. Fly out here, meet me here, hang out with me for a week. I'm going to change your life. And I said, okay, great. I'm going to do it. So I flew out there, hung out with him for a week. Doug changed my life in a very short period of time. He, over the course of a week, he taught me through scientific lectures and through in-person experience, how getting rid of all these animal products that I thought were the answer to my prayers getting rid of the meats, the cheeses, the turkey burgers, the fish, the oils, and transitioning to a 100% plant-based diet, but most importantly, 100% raw food diet, because that's the way he teaches. That by doing that, that my health would improve rapidly. So what I noticed in the first week was that my blood glucose came down very quickly and it stayed down. It was much more controllable. As a result of that, my insulin use fell significantly, about 40% in the first week. Energy levels up, hydration up, sleep better, anxiety levels way down. I felt like a million bucks. I, I mean, I, I, just, I felt reborn to a certain extent. And so that was the beginning of my entrance into the new world of plant-based nutrition. And from that moment onwards, I said, wow, the world just fundamentally changed for me in the span of seven days. Now I want to see if I can make a significant impact and learn about this from a scientific perspective. Yeah, well, let's go with that because, you know, you at that point pulled back the veil on the so-called vilified carbohydrates, which uh, interestingly enough, that same dietary plan is still being promoted by the American Diabetic Association and, and various people, endocrinologists and so on, still trying to help people with diabetes by you know, highlighting lean meats and no, and, you know, very little fruit and, and all of this stuff when, you know, they've sidestepped the real cause, which we know is fat. And we're going to talk about that quite a bit because sure. the fat content and the, we know, first of all, we know that regulating blood sugar is one of the, is probably the most important commodity in the human body. If Agreed. it goes too low or too high, we create problems at both ends. So the body in its wisdom is stuck with the dilemma, how do I maintain this within a very well-defined range of normal? Exactly. And it has a beautiful setup through the pancreas and the hormone called insulin to do just that. Exactly. So why don't you take people through uh, that model? And then I know you discussed the various forms of diabetes, and I know that's tricky for people. So if we can even just clarify type 1, type 2, and maybe something in between, and then relate that to insulin function. And I know you can do that in your own way really beautifully. So why don't you do that for the audience? Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, let's, let's start at the top. So when it comes to diabetes, canonically, people think of diabetes as basically having two different flavors. There's type one and there's type two. Okay. And that kind of has been the case for a certain, you know, for, for the majority of, you know, human history. But over the course of the last 20 to 30 years, it's gotten a little bit more complicated. Now, in today's world, there's type one, there's type 1 1.5, there's type two, there's prediabetes, there's gestational diabetes, and now there's type three diabetes. 
So there's now effectively six different flavors, if you will. Okay. Type one and type 1.5 are autoimmune conditions. That means that your own immune system is the reason why you have a blood glucose irregularity. In other words, your immune system has been tricked into destroying the immune, I'm sorry, into destroying the uh, insulin producing beta cells inside of your pancreas. And those are very, very, very critical cells because those are the only cells in your entire body that can manufacture and secrete insulin. And insulin is an incredibly powerful hormone that is required for human life. So when you lose the ability to manufacture your own insulin, then you have to take insulin from the outside world, AKA exogenous insulin. And that is a lifelong process. So, right. so that's, one one point five. that's an insulin dependency lifelong. And we know that, right? That's exactly right. That's, there's no, and, and, the, and the autoimmune found foundation, as you mentioned, is a little bit of a black box because we know that there are factors that can contribute to that, Correct. but there may be people even genetically coming into the world that have a predisposition for that. Perhaps they don't even have genes that are making the hormone insulin or they're, they're, they're doing things in that. So that's what makes it a little bit difficult to corral because you've got these mixed genetic and lifestyle factors that can promote this autoimmune outcome. But anyway, so the type one and 1 1.5 right. fall into that category. That's exactly right. So those are the, those are the two autoimmune flavors of, of diabetes. Now, uh, the difference between the two of them is that type one generally affects people who are younger than the age of 30. It's a strong autoimmune reaction, which means that as soon as it's initiated, you go from being a quote unquote normal individual with full insulin production to full insulin dependence, AKA zero insulin production within the span of about 12 to 18 months. So that's a rapid transition to zero insulin production. In type 1.5, it's generally people over the age of 30 years old, and it's a much, much slower transition to full insulin dependence. And truth be told, most people with type 1.5, they don't even get to full insulin dependence ever. So it could take them three years or five years or 10 years, or maybe they just lower their insulin production, but they never go to zero. So that's type 1.5, adult onset, slow progressing type one diabetes, if you wanna sum it up in a couple of words, okay? The rest of the diabetes are non-autoimmune. Uh, that means pre-diabetes and type two diabetes in particular, okay? 92% of the, of the population suffers from non-autoimmune diabetes. And that means that you develop this condition called insulin resistance. And we're going to go into detail about that. Insulin resistance, if uncorrected, turns into pre-diabetes. Pre-diabetes, if uncorrected, turns into type 2 diabetes. And type 2 diabetes is characterized by having a high fasting glucose of 126 or greater, or an A1C value of 6.5 or greater. Now, the beauty of, of this progression from insulin dependent to prediabetes to type two diabetes is that the whole spectrum is reversible. So if you started insulin resistant, then go to prediabetes and type two, you can actually go from type two back to prediabetes and from prediabetes back to insulin resistant and from insulin resistant back to non-diabetic. And so it's a reversible spectrum in about 90% of all situations. There's a small fraction of the population that can't do the full reversal. And those are people who have a effectively a compromised uh, insulin production capacity that you know means that their beta cell population has has been uh, has been compromised over the course of time, and as a result of that, they simply don't manufacture a sufficient amount of insulin. But for the most part, even if you do progress towards type two diabetes, you can still control it and get full control of your blood glucose by controlling your diet and lifestyle, especially by eating a plant-based diet. Okay. The last two forms of diabetes, we have gestational diabetes, which affects women when they are pregnant. They usually discover that they have gestational diabetes when they're pregnant, but it's just a warning sign that they were usually insulin resistant going into pregnancy. And even if you get rid of uh, gestational diabetes, when you deliver your child, there's a statistic that says within six, within the first five years of delivery, you have a 65% chance of progressing towards type two diabetes. Okay, so there's a very strong connection between women who have gestational and women who will develop type two diabetes down the road. And then finally, type three diabetes. This is, this is a form of diabetes that has been talked about for the last 10 to 15 years. And it's being called type three diabetes because it's actually Alzheimer's disease. It's diabetes of your brain, okay? So it's, it's what happens to your brain. It's when neurons become dysfunctional as a result of a process called cognitive decline. And that is a result of, uh, of, of neurological function 
that has been immersed in an insulin resistant environment over the course of many years. People canonically think of insulin resistance as only affecting your liver and muscle tissue, but it, it, in addition to that, it also affects your brain. It just takes a lot longer for your brain right. to manifest the symptoms. And some of that is tied into the process of glycation of protein, which I'm going to come back to later on with you because sure. in the aging field, that has become such a big part of the process of aging. And we now know that that's very much a problem of sugar instability and insulin resistance, as you brought up. So I want to get into the beautiful dance of insulin, how it works in this dance and the impact of diet specifically on that dance. Before I do that, we're going to just take a short break for a few seconds to uh, hear from our sponsor, the National Health Association. I'm here with Dr. Sai Kambada, and we'll be right back. And now to put a smile on the sponsors of the National Health Association, you're listening to the Health Science Podcast Show. I want to remind you to visit the National Health Association website, where you'll find incredible resources to support your healthy lifestyle, including plant-exclusive eating without added salt, oil, and sugar. Simply go to healthscience.org or nationalhealthassociation.org. Be sure to check out membership, which is $35 per year for those living within the U.S. and $55 for those living outside the U.S. You'll be amazed at all the information and benefits you'll receive. As a member, you're kept up to date on the latest evidence-based tools for health promotion. You'll receive the incomparable quarterly magazine, Health Science, a beautiful 40-page advertising-free publication mailed to your home or offices loaded with articles, recipes, inspirational stories, and interviews with world leaders in the fields of personal health, plant-based nutrition, water-only fasting, animal rights, and environmental support. And you'll receive details about life-changing events, such as the 2023 NHA conference set for June 23 to the 25th, 2023, in Cleveland, Ohio which will be the NHA 75th annual NHA conference. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and now back to the show. Welcome back to the Health Science Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and I'm here having an incredibly instructive dialogue with Dr. Sai Kambada on all things diabetic and diabetes. So we, we left with this idea of you know, beta cell production of insulin. Let's talk about the incredible dance of how insulin really works to control this process and then how dietary factors can kind of muck up the works, so to speak. Yep. Okay, great question. So uh, we've been told over and over and over again that the thing that causes diabetes is carbs. You, you walk out on the street, you ask 100 people what causes diabetes and you're bound to hear, well, you tell me, what, what are people going to tell you? Well, they're going to say high sugar intake, of course. And Bingo. they're going to say, don't eat things with sugar, especially even plant sugars, fruits, and all of these kinds of things, especially yep. that they've been so vilified. And so sugar is always portrayed as the problem. And probably 90% plus people walking the street have been instructed that sugar is the problem. That's exactly right. You nailed it. So they, they're told sugar is the problem. So don't eat foods that contain sugar. And they're also told that these things, these this general class of of nutrients called carbs are the problem. Anything that contains carbs are bad for you. It could be breads, cereals, pastas, crackers, cookies, brownies, sugar-sweetened beverages. It could also be fruits and potatoes. Right. Okay? Whether it's refined or whether it's whole, carbohydrates are your enemy and sugar is your enemy, so don't eat that stuff. And if you avoid that, then all of a sudden diabetes goes away, okay? Unfortunately, it's not that simple. Unfortunately, it's not true, okay? So, I don't want to insinuate, I don't want to mislead anybody. Eating refined carbohydrates and eating artificial sweeteners is not a good idea. And those foods have been shown to significantly increase your risk for many chronic diseases and can definitely move you in the path of developing prediabetes and type two. So don't get me, don't misinterpret my words, but there's a faster way to do it. There's, a, there's an easier way to get to type two diabetes. And this is the way that most people actually get there. And the way that you can get there is by overconsuming dietary fat. So dietary fat is present in the world in many different forms, okay? It comes predominantly from the animal world, from white meat, from red meat, from dairy products, from fish, and from seed oils. That's the predominant sources of food, I'm sorry, of, of fat in food. But then in addition to that, there's also plant-based sources like avocados and nuts and seeds and olives 
and coconuts. Okay. So regardless of what type of source you're getting your, your fat from, okay. Let's say you're eating it from uh, white meat and dairy products. You happen to eat that for breakfast, you put that in your mouth. Okay. The, the, the fat is actually locked up as a triglyceride. So triglyceride is basically just a fancy way of describing the storage form of fat in food. Okay. Triglyceride means tri, meaning three fatty acids and glyceride means glycerol. So glycerol is the backbone. It's just a particular type of carbohydrate molecule. And the triglyceride basically means that you have three fatty acids that are covalently bound to the glycerol backbone. So when you consume fat in food, you're actually consuming it as triglyceride. Triglyceride goes in your mouth, travels down your esophagus. It gets inside of your stomach. Inside of your stomach, there's an acid bath. It starts to uh, un unfold dietary protein and it starts to get at the fat and sort of start to linearize these molecules. And then eventually it gets inside of your small intestine. Your small intestine is where the bulk of all nutrient digestion occurs. Your small intestine is a brilliant, brilliant tissue because inside of your small intestine is where digestive enzymes do their work. Digestive enzymes are the enzymes that are responsible for enabling you to digest your food. And these include things like carbohydrases and lipases and proteases. These are all different names of, of enzymes that are secreted by your pancreas and your liver and your small intestine. And their job is to linearize, pro, uh, linearize molecules, cut the molecules from large pieces into small pieces, and then cut the small pieces again into individual what are called monomeric units. Okay, so if you take a triglyceride as an example, you take the glycerol off of the three fatty acids, and these three fatty acids can then get actually absorbed through the walls of your small intestine. They get put into your lymph system into little particles known as chylomicrons. Okay, so chylomicrons are, you can think of them as these little, they're little spaceships, okay? They're these little things, and there's trillions of them inside of your blood, and they're floating around at all times, okay? So the, the fatty acids get put inside of the chylomicrons. The chylomicron particles then move from your lymph system into your blood, and then they are present and they are floating in circulation free. Now, these chylomicrons have one mission and one mission only, and that is to unload their cargo. Their cargo is predominantly fatty acids, and then they also contain things called cholesterol esters or cholesterol if you want to, the storage form of cholesterol, okay? So... These chylomicron particles are trying to offload both the cholesterol and the fatty acids wherever they can do it. And it turns out that the best place to do that is actually your adipose tissue or your fat tissue. So these chylomicron particles are in circulation and they end up at the door of your adipose tissue where there's another enzymatic reaction that enables the chylomicron particles to offload the fatty acids and the fatty acids then get pulled into the adipose tissue, get put into adipocytes, which are fat cells, and then they're stuck in the fat cells for long periods of time. They could get put in the fat cells for a day or a week or a month or four years. It just depends on a number of different factors. It depends on how much you're moving your body. It depends on how much fat you're consuming and beyond. But the idea is that your adipose tissue is a long-term storage depot. It's the Costco of fat inside of your body. So these, 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 uh, the, the, Fatty acids are put into your adipose tissue. And that's actually a safe place to keep these fatty acids because they're put into a tissue that's enzymatically and mechanically designed for this process. The problem starts when there's an excess consumption of fatty acids from the food that you eat. And majority of those fatty acids go inside of your adipose tissue, but then there's a spillover. And the, the fatty acids that don't get into your adipose tissue, they have to go somewhere else. And where is that somewhere else? Well, that somewhere else is your liver and your muscle tissue. Now, your liver and muscle can accept or absorb fatty acids in small quantities because intracellularly, they have what's called a lipid droplet inside of them. And the lipid droplet is the location inside of the cell where fatty acids that cross the cell membrane can accumulate. And there's no problem with that. There's no problem with that as long as the quantity of fatty acids that is present inside of your blood is small. A small amount of fat gets transported across the cell membrane. A small amount of fat gets put on the lipid droplet. Everything is fine. But when the lipid concentration goes up because you had a high fat breakfast or you had a high fat lunch or you had a high fat dinner or you're doing this on a repeated basis, now the concentration of lipid in your blood goes up. The amount of fat that gets put into your adipose tissue goes up. 
the amount of fat that gets spilled over into your liver and muscle goes up. And as a result of that, the amount of lipid that's put into that lipid droplet goes up. So the lipid droplet inside of each one of these adipose, I'm sorry, inside of the, uh, the hepatocytes, which are the liver cells, or the myocytes, which are the muscle cells, starts to grow. And before you know it, the lipid droplet has grown to a point where it becomes inflammatory. Now, this is, the, this is the most important part of this process. The lipid droplet grows and grows and grows. As the lipid droplet grows, it gives rise to intracellular metabolites known as diacylglycerol and ceramids. Okay, So for all the super nerds out there, diacylglycerol and ceramids are very powerful signaling molecules because the two of these molecules, they actually go and they, they talk to the insulin receptor and they actually effectively handcuff the insulin receptor from the inside of the cell. And they prevent the insulin receptor from doing its job. And as a result of that, when that lipid droplet grows and grows and grows, it makes it such that the insulin receptor can't really be as effective anymore. So that means the next time that you go eat something that contains carbohydrate, it could literally be a banana or it could be you know, a small bowl of rice or quinoa that doesn't have that much carbohydrate energy. But the carbohydrate gets broken down into glucose and the glucose basically comes trying to get into that same cell, okay? Insulin, knock, knock, knocks on the door of the cell, says, hey, there's glucose in the blood. Do you want to take it up? And the insulin receptor goes, hey, normally I would respond to you and I would say, okay, sounds like a plan. And I would dock, I would, I would, I would communicate with insulin and then I would open the doors and I would let the glucose to come in. But here's the problem. I'm handcuffed right now. I'm handcuffed because that lipid droplet grew. It grew way too big. And now as a result of that, I can't do my job. So insulin goes, knock, knock. There's glucose. Do you want to take it up? And the cells go, sorry, I can't pay attention to you right now, okay? I'm playing insulin resistance. Right. I have initiated a self-defense mechanism to block you from talking to me because every time you talk to me, you put more stuff inside of me and I don't want more stuff, okay? Right. From an evolutionarily, evolutionary biology perspective, this is a beautifully designed system because insulin is the most powerful anabolic hormone in your body. In other words, insulin is responsible for more fuel storage and more cell growth than any other hormone in circulation. So when insulin is present, it basically tells cells to accept things, to, to undergo synthetic processes and pull fuel in. But these cells are responding to a high energy environment and they're saying, man, I have so much lipid inside of me. Where'd all this stuff come from? I didn't ask for it in the first place. So if I'm gonna try and stop more stuff from coming in, then if I just tell the insulin receptor to stop doing its job, then I can at least partially block more stuff from coming inside of me. And that enables them to slow down the rate at which things are coming inside. So let me simplify that image a little bit and see if this plays for you too. So yeah. insulin, when it's released, is very much like a key that opens the lock of the insulin receptor, which is kind of like a lock on the door of the cell itself within Correct. the membrane of the cell. So when the cell becomes space occupied by all of this fat, as the lipid droplet expands, there's really no space for that cell to accept sugar that it may want to put in reserve, like glycogen, for example. Exactly so then right. it will send a signal to block the receptor from actually responding to the lock, which is insulin, so that the door can no longer open. And so in that process, the body is resisting the attachment of insulin. And that's kind of where the phrase insulin resistance kind of comes into play. Can you live with that? That, that Very well said. Very let, me well ask said. You that, let me ask you this, though. In that process, because there's a couple of things that could play, you made the point that because the cell is occupied with so much fat, it can't really accept anything else like sugar. So it's really blocking the receptor from receiving insulin. Correct. Um, is it also directly affecting the receptor affinity itself, is the fat by any chance affecting the way that insulin would attach? Or yes. is it just feedback from the volume of what's happened inside the cell or do both things operate? So to the best of my knowledge, what happens is that there's a, what's called a post-translational modification to the insulin receptor itself. So the diacylglycerol and the ceramid end up, when I said handcuffing the insulin receptor, what they're actually doing is they're modifying one of the intracellular domains of the insulin receptor. So the protein itself changes in its conformation and its shape. Right. And that means that the actual activity of the protein itself right. goes down. So when they're insulin tries to dock, They're dunking up the receptor. It's almost like if you had a lock and you stuck 
all kinds of fat and junk and you would not be able to stick the key in there. So it's so exactly just, right. It's Go gunking put up that there. receptor. Okay. That's exactly right. Exactly right. So now sugar can't get in. So there's no choice for it to start to rise in the bloodstream. Obviously, as insulin is more and more blocked. Yeah, exactly right. So there's actually two things that happen simultaneously. Number one, insulin can't dock onto its receptor. So insulin says, knock, knock, there's glucose. Do you want to take it up? And the cells say, no, it's not. It's not my time right now. So that means that insulin is actually trapped because insulin cannot dock onto its receptor. So the concentration of insulin goes up, which means that you become hyperinsulinemic, the, aka there's excess insulin in your blood. That's not a good thing. Number two, because glucose can't get into tissues, you become hyperglycemic. So now simultaneously, as a result of insulin resistance, you have excess insulin and excess glucose in your blood at the same time, which means that when you go to the doctor and you go get a blood test, the blood test often shows in people living with insulin resistance that they have high blood glucose in the fasting state that translates to a high A1C value and their fasting insulin level is high. That is classic insulin resistance. And both of them are downstream effects of the liver and muscle cell that have, that have accumulated excess lipid over the course of time. And, and the point you made is a very important one because I think people have this sense that if they load up on lean meats, for example, or low, so-called lower fat animal proteins, that they're not getting that fat that gunks up the works when in fact that saturated fat that's provided from those foods Correct. is really the most risky of all. And this, this, this continual recommendation by groups like the American Diabetic Association, which recommends still to this day, load up on lean meats is really a very faulty recommendation because it's not understanding the true cause of this problem. You nailed it. You absolutely nailed it. And in addition to that, not only does the American Diabetes Association make those recommendations and they say things like, you know, fat, eat healthy fats. Healthy fats are okay for you. Then they take it one step further and people say, okay, well, saturated fat is actually not bad for you. So go ahead and eat saturated fat because there's no association or there's no cause between saturated fat and heart disease, which is a fallacy. And there's no, or there's no uh, direct link between saturated fat and diabetes, which is also a fallacy. And then you have the ketogenic world and the carnivore world, which take it to a whole new level. And they basically say, you know what? Not only is saturated fat not bad for you, saturated fat is the number one best nutrient in your entire food supply. So eat as much of that as possible. And I listen to this stuff and I'm just like, man, <laughs> where do you guys get your science from? Like what voodoo textbook are you reading that I just don't have access to? Because everything that I've learned and all the research that I've read for the past 100 years, right. it directly refutes all of these ridiculous claims about the fact that saturated fat is good for you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you've and, probably uh, seen it too, right? Oh, well, all the time. And, and that's why, you know, it's, and, and you've made the point in your own writing, and I love this, that, you know, short term use of diets like keto or high protein paleo, they are going to have effects of promoting initial weight loss. They are going to have effects of lowering fasting glucose, level, things in that regard. But the long term effect is the devastation of insulin resistance. And you are one of the people that have really highlighted the fact that because in insulin resistance, you not only have the hyperglycemia, but you also have the hyperinsulinemia. Uh, and because insulin works very much like a growth factor, it plays into so many chronic diseases that people don't even think about. So heart disease and even the, uh, the initiation and propagation of cancer because of this impact yes. of insulin resistance. And your writings have been so clear on showing that impact on chronic disease that I think a lot of people don't get in their mind that this can somehow relate to these very severe pathologies. And that's a very important uh, understanding that you share with people. I'm sitting here with uh, uh, Dr. Sai Kambada. We're talking about insulin. Uh, Sai, how, how can people find you? What's the best place to, to track you down and, 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 and get your information? Uh, thank you. So the best place to go is uh, masteringdiabetes.org. Uh, that is a sort of one-stop shop for everything that we do. We, have, we run a coaching program, and we basically help people implement a low-fat, plant-based, whole food diet because it's not that easy. I mean, it, it can be easy for some people, but you know, the goal is to try and use your food as medicine to reverse insulin resistance, and that's what we do. And your point is well made that the, the, uh, the use of carb-rich 
fruits and vegetables are really the solution to this problem, not the villain of this problem. And I think that's such an important piece. There's one other thing I want to talk about because you bring this up and I think it's so profound. And that is that when we look at nutrition and diet, there's a difference between nutrition and diet because diet relates to the things that we choose to eat. But nutrition involves all of the relationships that the body has with those things. And you've made the point that when people talk about, for example, the glycemic impact of a food, you have to realize that it's not just the sugar content that's important. You have to look at fiber content, water content, micronutrient content, because these things affect how food is digested and transported and burned and implemented. Can you speak to that just a little bit? Because I think we have too much of a short-sighted vision yeah. of nutrition. And when you're eating whole foods, like we're recommending, they provide all of those cofactors and micronutrients that really foster the way these things are utilized. So address yeah. that just a little bit if you can. Absolutely. You, you just nailed it, actually, because... Food is actually a very, very complex collection of nutrients. So the way that humans like to talk about food is we talk about carbs, fat, and protein, okay? We, we pretend like there's only really three components of food, and those are the only three components that we should ever care about, okay? But it turns out that food, okay, whether it comes from the plant-based world or whether it comes from the animal world, contains a lot more complexity, and the, there are three macronutrients, which are carbohydrate, fat, and protein. But then there's also five classes, six classes of micronutrients. That includes vitamins, minerals, fiber, water, antioxidants, and phytochemicals. Okay. So again, carbohydrate, fat, and protein are your macronutrients. Then you have vitamins, minerals, fiber, water, antioxidants, and phytochemicals, which are disease fighting plant chemicals that are only found in the plant world and that are just not found in the animal world. Okay. So I like to think of food as a collection of nine classes of nutrients. And those nine classes of nutrients have thousands of identities, thousands of identities that the scientific world hasn't even fully characterized yet. Okay. We, we know what most of them, not most of them, we know what a lot of them look like from a molecular perspective. We can draw their chemical structure on a piece of paper, but we don't really know how they interact with one another and how they interact with us. All we know is that foods that contain a significant antioxidant compound and a significant phytochemical compound have very potent disease fighting characteristics. Okay. So one way that I like to think about food is have you ever seen like a, uh, an, an overpass, a highway overpass being constructed before? You know, you're driving down the highway and you see this thing that's like on its way to being constructed, okay? If you take a look at it and you see how they're actually making it, well, what they do is they, they frame the outside of a pillar, as an example, with a bunch of wood. And then they have rebar on the inside, which are these metal pieces that are basically creating the structure of a eventual, um, you know, concrete pillar. And then once it's completely framed with wood on the outside and rebar on the outside, then they bring the, the cement trucks in and they pour the cement and the cement comes down and it fills the inside. Okay. So that is, is the way that I think about food. Okay. I think about fiber is the rebar. Okay. It's what holds the structure of plant-based foods in, um, together. And then all of the other stuff that gets poured in, that, that, that surrounds the rebar is the carbohydrate, the fat, the protein, the vitamins, the minerals, the water, the antioxidants, and the phytochemicals. So when you go to eat that food, you're actually having to tear apart very complex uh, you know, relationships between many different types of nutrients. And that digestive biochemistry that happens in your small intestine and large intestine unleashes this symphony of hundreds and thousands of different enzymes and transport mechanisms in order to break apart these nutrients and transport them to their eventual destination. And the more that I study the biochemistry and the, the deeper and deeper and deeper that I get into it, the more that I realize that human beings, we don't have a clue. We don't have a clue as to how it actually it's works. Totally mind blowing. I know it's amazing. Yeah. We're just scratching the surface and what we've learned so far is pretty darn compelling. And it's also the reason why processed foods, which lack those things, uh, create these spikes 
in sugar because they, they, there's such a rapid processing of these things because of their lack of the very nutrients that you're talking about. And that's a major Absolutely. problem. That's a huge, huge, huge problem, which is why you see that when people are eating these refined carbohydrate rich foods, you know, like cookies and crackers, pasta, chips, cereals, sodas, you know, waffles, eclairs, you name it. They eat those foods and they see their blood glucose, you know, rise very quickly after the meal. Right. You can even, there's some sophisticated experiments that actually demonstrate that you can see your triglyceride values also go up in a very short period of time after a meal. You can see your LDL concentrations also go up within hours. Sometimes you can see your blood pressure actually increase by five, six, seven milligram or millimeters of, of mercury. Right. Why is that? Well, the reason that is, is because these types of foods that are refined, they get broken apart very easily. It doesn't take very much digestive horsepower in order to get access to those nutrients. And then as soon as those nutrients are unleashed, they cause rapid rises in blood glucose, rapid rises in triglycerides, rapid rises in uh, the amount of fat that's put into LDL particles. And then you get this sort of rapid change in biochemical function. And as a result of that, when you do this for breakfast and lunch and dinner and breakfast and lunch and dinner, and you repeat this over and over and over again, it's no wonder that your adipose tissue is growing quickly. It's no wonder that your liver is in a state of distress. It's no wonder that your kidneys are in a state of distress as well. And you do that over the course of months to years. And before you know it, now you have multiple metabolic conditions happening simultaneously. We would be remiss if we didn't address the fact that ongoing consistent exercise also has such a huge benefit Massive. in reversing insulin resistance. Can you speak to that for just a little bit? Absolutely. Yeah. So exercise is an incredibly powerful tool to, uh, you know, there's, there's thousands of effects of exercise. So reversing the insulin resistance process is literally one of thousands of things that exercise can do for you. Now, we talked about the metabolic traffic jam that is created by excess dietary fat and the lipid droplet that blocks insulin from doing its job. Okay. When you exercise, what you do is you mechanically force muscle tissue to elongate and contract and elongate and contract hundreds, if not thousands of times within a given session. When you do that, you force the muscle tissue to have to start to burn or start to oxidize the fuels that it already has on board. It has two fuels on board. Number one, glycogen, which is a storage form of glucose. And number two, triglyceride, which is a storage form of fat. So as you use that muscle tissue, you are forcing that tissue to take the glucose molecules in the glycogen and send them to the mitochondria. And then take the fatty acids from the triglyceride and send them to the mitochondria. And that's good because your, your uh, glycogen reserve, your storage tank goes down and your fatty acid storage tank goes down. So basically the two storage tanks that contain fuel inside of your muscle tissue have now become partially depleted. And that's a good thing. So what that means is that when you eat food the next time, okay, insulin comes back to the cellular architecture, comes back to your liver, comes back to your muscle, goes knock, knock. I got some glucose in the blood. Would you like to take it up? those tissues can respond by saying, you know what? Yes, I'll take some more of it because I don't have that much glucose anymore. Some of my glycogen got depleted. I don't have as much fatty acids inside of me. So now I have a little bit more availability to get some of this glucose inside. So I like to think of exercise as being a, a way that you can force your muscle tissue into being more insulin sensitive. And the, another beautiful benefit is that, uh, Exercise enables your muscle to take up glucose from your blood independent of insulin. It's known as non-insulin dependent glucose uptake. And that's really powerful because insulin, when it's not needed and the muscle tissue can literally just vacuum or pull glucose in from the blood and then stick it inside of itself, that's really powerful because it causes your blood glucose to go down and it enables your, your, your muscle tissue to sort of act independently of insulin. And that happens post-exercise. And you, you mentioned something that will clarify for the audience. You talked about mitochondria. They just need to know that those are the factories in the cell where glucose is burned for energy production. Right. And the interesting thing about exercise, including weight training, is it actually increases the number of those factories in muscle cells, which is really a remarkable thing when you think about it. Factories Absolutely. are even improving for efficient burning. Let me shift gears for a second. So uh, what was the steps that led you and your partner, Robbie Barbaro, to really start mastering diabetes? I know that's, that's been your baby, that you guys have helped so many people, thousands of people 
with diabetes and metabolic, uh, you know, uh, dysfunction over the years. So what, what led to that and what was your, your motivation for really starting that whole process? Uh, I would say that the motivation for starting mastering diabetes was, I just wanted to help real people. I was working in a, at a biotech company when I graduated from UC Berkeley with a PhD. And when I was working at the biotech company, um, I was still performing experiments. I was getting a postdoctoral education and I was, you know, working with laboratory animals and I was creating spreadsheets and I was trying to analyze the results of my experiments. But I knew in the back of my head that my experiments were never going to go anywhere. They weren't going to actually cause people to change the way that they eat. They weren't going to have the profound impact on other people's lives that changing to a plant-based diet had on my life. So I am the type of person that wants to have an impact in this world. And I thought, you know what? If I just go work with real people and try and help the real people, maybe that can snowball into being a bigger and bigger and bigger thing down the road. And so when Robbie and I ended up meeting each other, we decided that we were going to help real people. And uh, within a very short period of time, we began to realize that the demand was very strong and that there were a lot of people who were looking for alternative ways to mm, reverse the insulin resistance process using their food as medicine. And that's exactly where we fit in. And you guys have done a masterful job of doing that, truly. I'm sitting Thank here with Dr. Sai Kambada, and uh, I, I encourage you to uh, follow Sai uh, with the Mastering Diabetes program. Pick up his book. Go online. Uh, you'll see the uh, website or you'll see the uh, URL in our show notes. And I encourage you to follow him. Before we break, do you have any final words of advice or, 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 or wisdom you'd like to share with the audience? Yeah, I would say... There's a lot of confusing information on the internet today. You know, we live in a time where there's more information available than at any time in human history. And yet the rate of increase of chronic disease is larger than it has ever been. It doesn't make any sense. You would think that more information would lead to more clarity, but more information has led to more confusion and more conflict. And that's unfortunate. Um, I have never seen in my life anything as powerful as a plant-based diet on reversing, not just managing, but reversing almost every chronic disease that I can think of. Okay, so diabetes is just one use case for why a plant-based diet is powerful, but there's a whole bunch of cardiovascular abnormalities, there's a whole bunch of kidney dysfunction, there's a whole bunch of liver dysfunction, uh, there's a whole bunch of cognitive decline, you name it. All of those conditions can be positively impacted by simply transitioning to a plant-based diet. And I've never in my time seen anything more powerful than a plant-based diet. I live it and breathe it every single day. You live it, you breathe it every single day. And once you have been infected with the power of a plant-based diet, you can't keep your mouth shut. And that's part of the reason why I am so motivated to try and teach as many people as possible and why I believe you're doing the same thing because it feels so good and you understand the power that it has. And I just wish that people would really give it a shot and give it a shot for like 90 days minimum and just feel what it does inside of yourself. Well, I want to thank Dr. Kambada for sharing his time and his information and wisdom with us today. I encourage you to follow him online and to uh, reach out to anybody suffering with these kinds of problems and know that there is recourse, that there is information out there that's valuable, that's evidence-based, that can help you deal with with the pain and torment that you may be dealing with in your own physical health. I want to thank uh, the audience for tuning in today. Without you, I can't do what we do here. Uh, I thank you for being part of this active community. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, uh, and on behalf of the National Health Association, I look forward to seeing you on the next podcast. You've been listening to the Health Science Podcast, brought to you by the National Health Association. Thank you for joining us today and for your commitment to evidence-based health science that backs a whole food plant exclusive lifestyle and contributes to the well-being of all people, animals, and our environment. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino. Be sure to leave a rating and a review, and we'll see you on the next show.